Hello and welcome to the podcast. This is Ron's Amazing Stories. We have stories that should thrill you a little and chill you a little. It's amazing. What you'll hear are adventures sent in by you guys, classic stories from the pulp mags, and episodes from the golden age of radio. We have special segments like Ghost Stories with Sylvia. That's amazing. And these are your stories. So settle in for the next hour and enjoy the show. One more thing. You just might want to prepare yourself to be taken away from today. Another five-minute mystery. This five-minute mystery is being brought to you by simplicity. Life is really simple, but we insist on making it complicated. That's true. That is true. Thank you. Ron's Amazing Stories is all about simplicity and culture. When did that happen? Our story takes us to the Long Island home of wealthy Mrs. Nottick, set in dense growth on a hill, lonesome, secluded, and dark. The shadow of a human figure climbs into a window, crosses the unlighted room to a safe in the wall. Two minutes later, the figure is gone, and in a matter of minutes, turmoil rules the house. Oh, this is terrible. Terrible. Philip, who could have done such a thing? Did anybody know you had the sapphire hair, Mrs. Nottingham? Only Jamie and I. It was just delivered from the bank this afternoon. What's going on down here? Oh, Jamie. The safe. Afraid we've had a thief in the night, Jamie. They've stolen the sapphire. It's gone. Jamie, could it have been one of the servants? What, Aunt Nora, none of them knew the stone was here. What's that stuck back in the safe there? Well, it's an envelope addressed to me. What? Well, then let's open it. Hmm. Plain paper, typewritten. It says, uh, 7th November, 1945, dear Mrs. Nottingham. Meet me at the old stone mill Wednesday night at 9. Bring with you $5,000 in cash, small bills and I will return your sapphire. If you report this theft, you'll never see the Nottingham sapphire again. No signature? No. Whoever did it must have known the stone was to be brought here, Aunt Laura. Look at the date. 7th November. That, that was yesterday. This robbery must have been planned for days. Well, there's nothing to do except get the stone back again. Tomorrow night at 9 o'clock, I'll meet our thief at the old stone mill. <laughs> He was as good as his word, Inspector Webster. I went alone to the mill, handed him the money, took the sapphire, and left. Yes, and a day later, you reported the matter to the police. But my aunt had to be sure of getting the stone back, Inspector. I begged Mrs. Nottingham to let me accompany her. Since I came from England three weeks ago, I've been a guest in her house. I wanted to help. But uh, this note, it tells us a great deal, Mrs. Nottingham. What, Inspector? Whoever wrote it is obviously the thief. Someone who was close enough to you to manage the combination of the safe. I'm afraid that's true, Aunt Laura. The sapphire was delivered from the bank a few hours before it was stolen. And only you, Mrs. Nottingham, and your nephew, knew about it. None of the servants did. Mr. Philip Harrison here. Is he the only Englishman in your house? Why, yes. And uh, do you really want to find the thief? Of course we do. Then I may as well tell you. I'm arresting Mr. Harrison as the thief. Come along, Harrison. I'll take your confession at headquarters. What led Inspector Webster to believe Philip Harrison was the culprit? In a moment, we'll hear the solution, but first... What an exciting beginning this one had. We have very different ideas of excitement. I guess. But couldn't you feel the tension when the thief worked his stealthful magic and made off with the jewel? Um, did we just listen to the same story? All I heard was some bloody awful acting and some silly calendar references. And you call me an idiot? Yes, I do. And now, back to our story. Until Philip Harrison confessed, we had no proof of his guilt. Although the note itself was enough for me. As you probably know, we Americans always date our letters by first designating the month, then the day. In England, the custom is different. Letters are dated day first, then the month, as in the note, 7th November, 1945. So you can see, in that note, Philip Harrison unconsciously wrote his own confession. Hmm. 
Hmm, I do think that you need a bit more evidence than that date stuff. Agreed. Perhaps they will find the missing $5,000. But you do have to applaud the simplicity of it all. Well, you know what they say. And, that is? Simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. Oh, I like that, but you're still an idiot. Hello, and welcome to the podcast. Today, it is all about the kids. Sort of. Yeah! Our featured offering today comes from the pen of Oscar Wilde, who is not known for writing children's stories. But here we are. Is it good? Well, we have the classic short story, The Happy Prince, and I think it's pretty good. There must be more. There is. We have a story from Rodney about green eyes, and we present another Our Amazing Stories, all about the Oxford English Dictionary. Mm, That sounds a little boring. Well, I assure you it's not. It's a real Scrabble player's dream. It's a mistake. I suppose it's too late to stop it now. It is. But I tell you, You're going to love it. Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook and a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash Ron's Amazing Stories. They have over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, computer, Kindle. Whatever you have, you can listen to Audible on it. So what am I listening to? Fractured Spirits, Haunting at the Peoria State Hospital, narrated by Leanne Howlett. Now you might be wondering why I didn't tell you who authored this. Well, that's because the book was written by our very own Sylvia Schultz. This is her third book that has been turned into an audio book, and it just might be the best. During the first half of the 20th century, the Peoria State Hospital was the premier mental health facility of its day. Dr. George Zeller created a model for the care of the mentally ill. Today, there are only a few buildings left at the hospital. Some of them are still in use. Others are inhabited only by ghosts. Our guide to these ghosts and the history that they represent is Sylvia Schultz. Sylvia, what can you tell us about this book? Well, Ron, I was really excited to write this book. It came about because I got curious. I was hearing stories about this abandoned mental asylum, so I started investigating it and started collecting people's ghost stories about it. But the neat thing about this hospital is that the history and the compassion with which these patients were treated is just as fascinating as the ghost stories. So learning about the legacy of care that came out of this hospital for the treatment of the mentally ill was just as special to me as hearing all those wonderful ghost stories. How cool is it that three of your books have been made into Audible books? Oh, I am so very grateful for this. Just, I listen to a lot of books on CD when I'm driving places and they just make the hours fly and make the miles pass like nothing. So it's a real treat to have somebody reading a book to you. I grew up with my father reading to us kids too. So I'm just so very grateful that my books are being read to people in this way. I guess my last question uh, about this is What can we expect from this book? Is it all just history? Or what is the quintessential thing that we should take away from Fractured Spirits? 
The quintessential thing you need to remember is that this was a place like no other. The ghosts are fascinating, yes, and the reason they are still there is because they received such excellent care. They want to spend their afterlife there. This was a place of compassion, and that is what I really wanted to make people realize. This isn't a scary place. This isn't a place where the patients were abused and resulted in hauntings because of that. This resulted in hauntings because of the family nature of the Peoria State Hospital. Well, Sylvia, we have a clip from the book, and it comes from the chapter titled The Pollock Hospital. Now, we've talked about that one many times. It tells the story of your friend David and his encounter with a spirit. But before I play this clip, you say that David is a sensitive in this story. And me, personally, I'm not 100% sure what that means. Can you give us a quick definition? Of course. There are sensitives, and then there are psychic mediums, and the two is sort of the person's own interpretation of what they experience. A sensitive will be aware of different energies, the energies of people that have passed on, because that's all a ghost is, really, is life energy le left over. And a medium is someone who can pick up on that energy enough to be able to communicate with the spirit of the person that has passed on. We have mediums that are clairvoyant, they can see dead people, they clairaudient, they can hear them, clairsentient, they can understand what they're saying just in their minds. A sensitive usually won't claim that much of a connection. A sensitive will be aware of that energy, but they may not be able to communicate as well as a psychic medium. All right, well, let's play the clip. When Dark Continents Publishing launched the first baker's dozen of books in its product line, the president of the company decided to do some good. I've known David M. Youngquist for several years, and he loves the written word with a clear, undeniable passion. At his suggestion, the company decided to donate one copy of each book in its catalog to two area libraries. One, up in David's neck of the woods, was the tiny Sheffield Library. Dark Continent's donation of 13 books covered three-quarters of their book purchasing for the year. The other library chosen to receive a full complement of books was the library I work for, Fond du Lac District Library in East Peoria. Our director was thrilled with the donation and called the local paper in to take pictures. David drove down from Princeton with a back seat full of books. Since it was a drive of an hour and a half for him, he asked me to suggest other area libraries for him to visit that morning. The plan was for David to make Fond du Lac his first stop, donate the books, then visit a few more libraries. Then he'd drive back to East Peoria, meet me for lunch, then drive home. I gave him detailed directions, sending him from East Peoria to Pekin, then across the river to Alpha Park Library in Bartonville. Now, David's a sensitive... As I handed him the sheet of directions, I said, Okay, now after you cross the river and go north into Bartonville, you're going to turn left at the first stoplight and go up a hill. At the top of the hill, you're going to pass a great big stone building on your right. Put your guards up. I'm not kidding about this. Halfway through my morning, I got a text message from David. Was there a TB ward at this hospital you keep telling me about? Yep. It was called the Pollock Hospital. Thought so. I picked up a hitchhiker. Later, over lunch, David told me the whole story. He had been driving up Pfeiffer Road and was just passing the Bowen when he felt a heavy tightness in his chest. Then he became aware of someone sitting in the passenger seat of his truck. It was a lanky guy dressed in working man's clothes. You know how you can tell an old farmer by his hands? Their hands are big, calloused, with swollen knuckles from a lifetime of work. I could tell this had been a big guy, but he'd gotten sick later in life. David said, Um, hello there. My name's David. What's yours? George, came the reply. What's the problem, George? 
I've got TB. Given the sympathetic tightness in his chest, David had been expecting that answer. When did you die? This question didn't get an answer. The shade in David's passenger seat was silent. David figured that either George didn't know he was dead, or he didn't feel like discussing it. He tried another question. You're not coming home with me, are you? No, this is my home. So, why are you in my car? An ethereal shrug. I don't get out much. David gave a mental snort. Wait, what? You're an incorporeal being. What do you mean, you don't get out much? But David's a nice guy, and he didn't object to George riding along with him. The Alpha Park Library is still technically on the grounds of the old asylum, so George wasn't going off of the grounds without a pass or anything like that. David did his library visit, although he told me he felt a little funny about it. As he talked with the librarian, he kept casting surreptitious glances over his shoulder, trying to make sure George didn't wander too far away. He didn't want to leave the guy behind. After leaving the library, David and George rode all the way back down Pfeiffer Road together. At the bottom of the hill, George said, Well, thanks for putting up with me. Then he vanished from the passenger seat. He was very cordial, David said. He was one of the most pleasant, well-behaved spirits I've ever encountered. Well, fractured spirits haunting at the Peoria State Hospital, Sylvia brings the passion for the paranormal investigation to her adventures at this haunted hotspot. The spirits come to life once more as she explores their former home. A true ghost story over a hundred years in the making. Fractured Spirits is a narrative of nonfiction at its finest. And you can have this book today. Here is what Audible has set up for us. They are offering a free audiobook and 30 days to give you the opportunity to check out their service. This includes free access to the Audible Plus catalog, which is updated monthly with new titles. To download your free audiobook today, go to audibletrial.com slash Ron's Amazing Stories. Again, that's audibletrial.com slash Ron's Amazing Stories, and you can get Fractured Spirit today. Thank you, Audible, and Sylvia, thank you. Oh, Ron, it was my pleasure. These are your stories, sent by you, for you. We have but one story this time, but it truly is amazing. It was sent in by Rodney Andrews, who hails from Hearts Crossing, Pennsylvania. When I was 14, I had an experience that I will never forget. I was the kind of kid who always got picked on in school. The kind of target that people loved. Sometimes I'd stand up for myself, and other times I was just intimidated. When I was a kid, I didn't know anything. Today, at age 64, I still don't know anything. But I'm happy to be here, and I do love your podcast. I hope you can use my story. One night I decided I wasn't going to deal with it anymore, and I would self-delete. I had been planning it in my bedroom, thinking, how would I do it? I cried a little and said that it would all be over and I wouldn't have to deal with it anymore. The next thing I knew, I wasn't in my bed. I'm floating. Something has me. I stare at the closet mirror and I see my body hanging there in the air, blankets dangling. The good thing was that I wasn't making any more plans either. All I did was float. Then... I fell into my bed. I still remember the shaking and the cold shiver going down my spine. I'm feeling it right now as I type this. It's never really ever gone away that I remember. Back to the story because it wasn't over. There were two green eyes staring at me. Two big green eyes. I'll never forget them. 
They were like emeralds, but they were bright, and they were on fire. They just kept looking at me, and I kept looking at them. I remember it was 1.14 a.m. when I was grabbed, and I kept staring at those crazy eyes until the sun came up. I don't remember if they ever faded or even disappeared. I just remembered that I prayed for the sun to come and that I would still be alive. God, I had to fight the urge not to run. The next morning, I told my parents. They didn't believe me. No one really ever believed me. Everyone thought I made it up except for my friend Mark. People just thought it was some crazy story that Icky Rodney made up. Years later, I saw the movie Stone Tapes. I never really heard of it until I was like 23. In the ending, the mysterious creature shows up and kills the main heroine. It had green eyes. I broke down. Those were the same color eyes that I had saw all those years ago. I'm not a small guy, but I freaked out, crawled under my counter, and hid in the space between the wall and the cabinet. It took Mark 30 minutes to calm me down. Those green eyes terrify me to this day. I don't know if it was a ghost, dynamic, or something from another plane of existence. I do know that it probably saved my life, but at what cost? I don't know. I don't need to know. I don't want to know. Rodney Andrews, Hearts Crossing, Pennsylvania. That is one amazing story, to be sure. I looked up the movie The Stone Tape. It was released in 1972 and told the tale of a research team from an electronics company. They moved into an old Victorian house to start work on finding a new recording medium. Then team member Jill Greenlee witnesses a ghost. They decide not to only analyze the apparition, but to exercise it as well. With terrifying results. I don't know how much of that story relates to yours, but I can honestly see how it could be a trigger for you. I am thankful to your ghost for one thing. You are still here. Thank you, Rodney, for your story. Well, that's it for this time. If you have a story that you want to share, like Rodney did, head to the main website at ronsamazingstories.com and click on the Story Submission banner. Leave your story, give it a title, and please tell me where you're from. I'll read it if I can. Our featured story is a classic from the novel The Happy Prince and Other Tales by Oscar Wilde. The first printing of this book was in May of 1888. There are a total of five stories and the one we will hear today is called The Happy Prince. In a town full of suffering poor people, a swallow who was left behind after his flock flew off to Egypt for the winter meets the statue of the late Happy Prince. Our story is a classic reading done by the great David Sweeney Bear. Please enjoy The Happy Prince by Oscar Wilde. High above the city, on a tall column, stood the statue of the Happy Prince. He was gilded all over with thin leaves of fine gold. For eyes he had two bright sapphires, and a large red ruby glowed on his sword hilt. He was very much admired indeed. He is as beautiful as a weathercock, remarked one of the town councillors who wished to gain a reputation for having artistic tastes. Only not quite so useful, he added, fearing lest people should think him unpractical, which he really was not. "'Why can't you be like the happy prince?' asked a sensible mother of her little boy who was crying for the moon. "'The happy prince never dreams of crying for anything.' 
I am glad there is someone in the world who is quite happy, muttered a disappointed man as he gazed at the wonderful statue. He looks just like an angel, said the charity children as they came out of the cathedral in their bright scarlet cloaks and their clean white pinafores. How do you know? said the mathematical master. You have never seen one. Ah, but we have, in our dreams, answered the children, and the mathematical master frowned and looked very severe, for he did not approve of children dreaming. One night there flew over the city a little swallow. His friends had gone away to Egypt six weeks before, but he had stayed behind, for he was in love with the most beautiful reed. He had met her early in the spring as he was flying down the river after a big yellow moth, and had been so attracted by her slender waist that he had stopped to talk to her. Shall I love you? said the swallow, who liked to come to the point at once, and the reed made him a low bow. So he flew round and round her, touching the water with his wings and making silver ripples. This was his courtship, and it lasted all through the summer. It is a ridiculous attachment, twittered the other swallows. She has no money and far too many relations. And indeed, the river was quite full of reeds. Then, when the autumn came, they all flew away. After they had gone, he felt lonely and began to tire of his lady love. She has no conversation, he said, and I am afraid that she is a coquette, for she is always flirting with the wind. And certainly, whenever the wind blew, the reed made the most graceful curtsies. I admit that she is domestic, he continued, but I love travelling, and my wife, consequently, should love travelling also. Will you come away with me? he said finally to her, but the reed shook her head. She was so attached to her home. You have been trifling with me, he cried. I am off to the pyramids. Good bye. And he flew away. All day long he flew, and at night time he arrived at the city. Where shall I put up? he said. I hope the town has made preparations. Then he saw the statue on the tall column. I will put up there, he cried. It is a fine position with plenty of fresh air. So he alighted just between the feet of the happy prince. I have a golden bedroom. He said softly to himself as he looked round, and he prepared to go to sleep. But just as he was putting his head under his wing, a large drop of water fell on him. What a curious thing! he cried. There is not a single cloud in the sky. The stars are quite clear and bright, and yet it is raining. The climate in the north of Europe is really dreadful. The reed used to like the rain, but that was merely her selfishness. Then another drop fell. What is the use of a statue if it cannot keep the rain off? he said. I must look for a good chimney pot. And he determined to fly away. But before he had opened his wings, a third drop fell, and he looked up and saw. Ah, what did he see? The eyes of the happy prince were filled with tears, and tears were running down his golden cheeks. His face was so beautiful in the moonlight that the little swallow was filled with pity. Who are you? he said. I am the happy prince. Why are you weeping then? asked the swallow. You have quite drenched me. When I was alive and had a human heart, answered the statue, I did not know what tears were, for I lived in the palace of Sans Souci. Where sorrow is not allowed to enter. In the daytime I played with my companions in the garden, and in the evening I led the dance in the great hall. Round the garden ran a very lofty wall, but I never cared to ask what lay beyond it. Everything about me was so beautiful. My courtiers called me the happy prince, and happy indeed I was, if pleasure be happiness. So I lived, and so I died. And now that I am dead, they have set me up here so high that I can see all the ugliness and all the misery of my city. And though my heart is made of lead, yet I cannot choose but weep.
What? Is he not solid gold? said the swallow to himself. He was too polite to make any personal remarks out loud. Far away, continued the statue in a low musical voice. Far away in a little street there is a poor house. One of the windows is open, and through it I can see a woman seated at a table. Her face is thin and worn, and she has coarse red hands, all pricked by the needle, for she is a seamstress. She is embroidering passion flowers on a satin gown for the loveliest of the queen's maids of honour to wear at the next court ball. In a bed in the corner of the room, her little boy is lying ill. He has a fever and is asking for oranges. His mother has nothing to give him but river water, so he is crying. Swallow, swallow, little swallow, will you not bring her the ruby out of my sword hilt? My feet are fastened to this pedestal, and I cannot move. I am waited for in Egypt, said the swallow. My friends are flying up and down the Nile and talking to the large lotus flowers. Soon they will go to sleep in the tomb of the great king. The king is there himself in his painted coffin. He is wrapped in yellow linen and embalmed with spices. Round his neck is a chain of pale green jade, and his hands are like withered leaves. Swallow, swallow, little swallow, said the prince. Will you not stay with me for one night and be my messenger? The boy is so thirsty, and the mother so sad. I don't think I like boys, answered the swallow. Last summer, when I was staying on the river, there were two rude boys, the miller's sons, who were always throwing stones at me. They never hit me, of course. We swallows fly far too well for that. And besides, I come of a family famous for its agility. But still, it was a mark of disrespect. But the happy prince looked so sad that the little swallow was sorry. It is very cold here, he said, but I will stay with you for one night and be your messenger. Thank you, little swallow, said the prince. So the swallow picked out the great ruby from the prince's sword and flew away with it in his beak over the roofs of the town. He passed by the cathedral tower where the white marble angels were sculptured. He passed by the palace and heard the sound of dancing. A beautiful girl came out on the balcony with her lover. How wonderful the stars are, he said to her, and how wonderful is the power of love. I hope my dress will be ready in time for the state ball. She answered, I have ordered passion flowers to be embroidered on it, but the seamstresses are so lazy. He passed over the river and saw the lanterns hanging to the masts of the ships. He passed over the ghetto and saw the old Jews bargaining with each other and weighing out money in copper scales. At last he came to the poorhouse and looked in. The boy was tossing feverishly on his bed, and the mother had fallen asleep, she was so tired. In he hopped and laid the great ruby on the table beside the woman's thimble. Then he flew gently round the bed, fanning the boy's forehead with his wings. How cool I feel, said the boy. I must be getting better. And he sank into a delicious slumber. Then the swallow flew back to the happy prince and told him what he had done. It is curious, he remarked, but I feel quite warm now, although it is so cold. That is because you have done a good action, said the prince. And the little swallow began to think, and then he fell asleep. Thinking always made him sleepy. When day broke, he flew down to the river and had a bath. What a remarkable phenomenon, said the professor of ornithology as he was passing over the bridge. A swallow in winter. And he wrote a long letter about it to the local newspaper. Everyone quoted it. It was full of so many words that they could not understand. Tonight I go to Egypt, said the swallow, and he was in high spirits at the prospect. He visited all the public monuments and sat a long time on top of the church steeple. Wherever he went, the sparrows chirruped and said to each other, What a distinguished stranger! So he enjoyed himself very much. When the moon rose, he flew back to the happy prince. Have you any commissions for Egypt? he cried. I am just starting. Swallow, swallow, little swallow, 
said the prince. Will you not stay with me one night longer? I am waited for in Egypt, answered the swallow. Tomorrow my friends will fly up to the second cataract. The river horse couches there among the bulrushes, and on a great granite throne sits the god Memnon. All night long he watches the stars, and when the morning star shines, he utters one cry of joy, and then he is silent. At noon the yellow lions come down to the water's edge to drink. They have eyes like green barrels, and their roar is louder than the roar of the cataract. Swallow, swallow, little swallow, said the prince. Far away, across the city, I see a young man in a garret. He is leaning over a desk covered with papers, and in a tumbler by his side there is a bunch of withered violets. His hair is brown and crisp, and his lips are red as a pomegranate, and he has large and dreamy eyes. He is trying to finish a play for the director of the theatre, but he is too cold to write any more. There is no fire in the grate, and hunger has made him faint. I will wait with you one night longer, said the swallow, who really had a good heart. Shall I take him another ruby? Alas, I have no ruby now. Said the prince, "My eyes are all that I have left. They are made of rare sapphires which were brought out of India a thousand years ago. Pluck out one of them and take it to him. He will sell it to the jeweller and buy food and firewood and finish his play." "Dear prince," said the swallow, "I cannot do that," and he began to weep. "Swallow, swallow, little swallow," said the prince. Do as I command you. So the swallow plucked out the prince's eye and flew away to the student's garret. It was easy enough to get in, as there was a hole in the roof. Through this he darted and came into the room. The young man had his head buried in his hands, so he did not hear the flutter of the bird's wings. And when he looked up, he found the beautiful sapphire lying on the withered violets. I am beginning to be appreciated, he cried. This is from some great admirer. Now I can finish my play, and he looked quite happy. The next day, the swallow flew down to the harbor. He sat on the mast of a large vessel and watched the sailors hauling big chests out of the hold with ropes. Heave ahoy! They shouted as each chest came up. I am going to Egypt, cried the swallow, but nobody minded. And when the moon rose, he flew back to the happy prince. I am come to bid you goodbye," he cried. "Swallow, swallow, little swallow," said the prince. "Will you not stay with me one night longer?" "It is winter," answered the swallow, "and the chill snow will soon be here. In Egypt, the sun is warm on the green palm trees, and the crocodiles lie in the mud and look lazily about them." My companions are building a nest in the temple of Baalbek, and the pink and white doves are watching them and cooing to each other. Dear prince, I must leave you, but I will never forget you. And next spring I will bring you back two beautiful jewels in place of those you have given away. The ruby shall be redder than a red rose, and the sapphire shall be as blue as the great sea. In the square below, said the happy prince, there stands a little match girl. She has let her matches fall in the gutter, and they are all spoiled. Her father will beat her if she does not bring home some money, and she is crying. She has no shoes or stockings, and her little head is bare. Pluck out my other eye and give it to her, and her father will not beat her. I will stay with you one night longer," said the swallow. "But I cannot pluck out your eye. You would be quite blind then." Swallow. Swallow, little swallow," said the prince. "Do as I command you." So he plucked out the prince's other eye and darted down with it. He swooped past the match girl and slipped the jewel into the palm of her hand. "What a lovely bit of glass!" cried the little girl, and she ran home laughing. Then the swallow came back to the prince. "You are blind now," he said. "So I will stay with you always." No, little swallow," said the poor prince. "You must go away to Egypt. I will stay with you 
always, said the swallow, and he slept at the prince's feet. All the next day he sat on the prince's shoulder and told him stories of what he had seen in strange lands. He told him of the red ibises who stand in long rows on the banks of the Nile and catch goldfish in their beaks, of the sphinx who is as old as the world itself and lives in the desert and knows everything, of the merchants who walk slowly by the side of their camels and carry amber beads in their hands, of the king of the mountains of the moon who is as black as ebony and worships a large crystal, of the great green snake that sleeps in a palm tree and has twenty priests to feed it with honey cakes, and of the pygmies who sail over a big lake on large flat leaves and are always at war with the butterflies. Dear little swallow, said the prince, you tell me of marvellous things, but more marvellous than anything is the suffering of men and of women. There is no mystery so great as misery. Fly over my city, little swallow, and tell me what you see there. So the swallow flew over the great city and saw the rich making merry in their beautiful houses while the beggars were sitting at the gates. He flew into dark lanes and saw the white faces of starving children looking out listlessly at the black streets. Under the archway of a bridge, two little boys were lying in one another's arms to try and keep themselves warm. How hungry we are, they said. You must not lie here, shouted the watchman, and they wandered out into the rain. Then he flew back and told the prince what he had seen. I am covered with fine gold, said the prince. You must take it off, leaf by leaf, and give it to my poor. The living always think that gold can make them happy. Leaf after leaf of the fine gold the swallow picked off, till the happy prince looked quite dull and grey. Leaf after leaf of the fine gold he brought to the poor, and the children's faces grew rosier, and they laughed and played games in the street. We have bread now, they cried. Then the snow came, and after the snow came the frost. The streets looked as if they were made of silver, they were so bright and glistening. Long icicles like crystal daggers hung down from the eaves of the houses. Everybody went about in furs, and the little boys wore scarlet caps and skated on the ice. The poor little swallow grew colder and colder, but he would not leave the prince. He loved him too well. He picked up crumbs outside the baker's door when the baker was not looking, and tried to keep himself warm by flapping his wings. But at last he knew that he was going to die. He had just strength to fly up to the prince's shoulder once more. Goodbye, dear prince, he murmured. Will you let me kiss your hand? I am glad that you are going to Egypt at last, little swallow, said the prince. You have stayed too long here, but you must kiss me on the lips, for I love you. It is not to Egypt that I am going, said the swallow. I am going to the house of death. Death is the brother of sleep, is he not? And he kissed the happy prince on the lips and fell down dead at his feet. At that moment a curious crack sounded inside the statue, as if something had broken. The fact is that the leaden heart had snapped right in two. It certainly was a dreadfully hard frost. Early the next morning the mayor was walking in the square below in company with the town councillors. As they passed the column he looked up at the statue. Dear me, how shabby the happy prince looks, he said. How shabby indeed, cried the town councillors, who always agreed with the mayor, and they went up to look at it. The ruby has fallen out of his sword, his eyes are gone, and he is golden no longer, said the mayor. In fact, he is little better than a beggar. Little better than a beggar, said the town councillors. And here is actually a dead bird at his feet, continued the mayor. We must really issue a proclamation that birds are not to be allowed to die here. And the town clerk made a note of the suggestion. So they pulled down the statue of the happy prince. As he is no longer beautiful, he is no longer useful, said the art professor at the university. 
Then they melted the statue in a furnace, and the mayor held a meeting at the corporation to decide what was to be done with the metal. We must have another statue, of course, he said, and it shall be a statue of myself. Of myself, said each of the town councillors, and they quarrelled. When I last heard of them, they were quarrelling still. What a strange thing, said the overseer of the workmen at the foundry. This broken lead heart will not melt in the furnace. We must throw it away. So they threw it on a dust heap where the dead swallow was also lying. Bring me the two most precious things in the city, said God to one of his angels, and the angel brought him the leaden heart and the dead bird. You have rightly chosen, said God, for in my garden of paradise this little bird shall sing for evermore. And in my city of gold, the happy prince shall praise me. End of the Happy Prince, by Oscar Wilde. Read by David Sweeney Bear, DSBAudio.com. I hope that you enjoyed that story. It is a children's tale, but I think it represents the abilities of the author, Oscar Wilde. Even in the 1880s, a good story is still. A good story. I loved the whimsical nature of it, and of course, who doesn't love a true happy ending? Our author, Oscar Wilde, was a great Irish poet and playwright. After writing in different forms throughout the 1880s, he became one of the most popular playwrights in London in the early 1890s. He's best remembered for his epigrams. Epigram refers to his insights and witty remarks. At the height of his fame and success, he wrote the play *The Importance of Being Earnest*, a trivial comedy for serious people, which is still being performed in London to this day. Wilde prosecuted the Marquis of Queensbury for statements that he made about Wilde. The Marquis was the father of Wilde's lover, Lord Alfred Douglas. The trial unearthed evidence that caused Wilde to drop his charges and led to his own arrest and trial for gross indecency with men. After two more trials, he was convicted and sentenced to two years hard labor, the maximum penalty, and was jailed from 1895 to 1897. After he was released, he spent the rest of his life in exile. He lived in France, where he passed away from cerebral meningitis on November twenty-fifth, nineteen hundred. J E L L O, the big red letters stand for the Jello family. Oh, the big red letters stand for the Jello family. That's Jello, yum yum yum. Jello pudding, yum yum yum. Jello ducks, the yolk of pudding, just so real. Yes, it is our amazing stories. But just what does that mean? We have segments for your stories, one for strange moments in history, and even one that plays clips from the golden age of radio to take us back in time. So, what makes this segment different? Our amazing stories looks at people who did amazing things. So sit back and listen to this incredible tale. Once or twice during my formative years, I was accused of reading the dictionary. You see, I'm an avid Scrabble player. Although untrue, I will admit that I have skimmed a page or two on occasion. I do look up the meaning of unfamiliar words, and I do own a copy of the compact edition of the Oxford English Dictionary. With reading glasses, of course. I guess there is some personal fascination with the dictionary, but who doesn't appreciate a well-chosen word, a lovely turn of phrase, or the etymology of an interesting term? In 1928, when the first edition of the Oxford English Dictionary (OED) was finally completed, after a little over 70 years, 
British Prime Minister Stanley Baldwin began his toast with the remark that if he were lost on a desert island, he would choose the OED for company because... Our history, our novels, our poems, our plays, they're all in this one book. And I have to say, I fully agree. The OED sprang as an idea in 1857 from several members of the Philosophical Society in London. They felt that the current dictionaries were not comprehensive or accurate enough. An ideal dictionary would contain all obsolete words, all families and groups of words, accurate documenting of the earliest appearance of the words, detailed meanings and sense of words, and all literature had to be read and scanned for illustration of these meanings. To sum it up, the best dictionary needed to contain the meaning of everything. That is quite a request and one monumental task. The illustrative quotes are the essence of the Oxford English Dictionary. These reveal the history and usage of the language through the centuries. But how was all that literature to be read, all the words listed, and the earliest appearances found? Well, by making a call to the public, asking for volunteers around the English-speaking world to read and extract quotations from various books. The dictionary was for the people, so why not have them help research it? And they did. Ultimately, more than 800 readers responded with their assistance. Keep in mind that this project began in 1857 and took over 70 years to complete. Oh, and there was no social media, no cloud storage, or even any kind of internet. It was up to the Royal Mail. Besides these readers, the OED required the work of many others. There were sorters, sub-editors, assistant editors, editors, compositors, that's typesetters, printers, proofreaders, professional authorities, delegates, and even some Oxford deans. The poets Tennyson and Browning were consulted about the meaning of the words that appeared in their poems. J. R. R. Tolkien was an assistant lexographer for one year in 1919. No less than six editors guided the process, with the bulk done by James Murray. Also, several of his children helped throughout the years. This gargantuan project required a lot of paper man-hours, and time. Here are some dizzying facts about the ten-volume first complete edition of the Oxford English Dictionary. The first mock-up edition was published January 29, 1884. When the completed edition was published in 1928, a full set was priced at 50 guineas, about eight-tenths of a pence per page. In today's U.S. dollars, that's $2,242.43. The most quoted work from the OED was a 14th century poem titled Cursi Mundi. This is an early 14th century religious poem written in Middle English that presents the extensive retelling of the history of Christianity from the creation to doomsday. The text of the original OED would cover 178 miles. Of course, that would depend upon the font size of the type. Now here's the big one. There are 1,827,306 illustrative quotations, and it included 414,825 words. Now, if you're inclined to read the OED, even at one word a day, the original 400,000 plus words would take over 1,000 years to read. That gives a whole new meaning to what's your word of the day. It was estimated that the project would be finished in approximately 10 years. Five years down the road, when Murray and his colleagues had reached only the word ant, they realized that it was time to reconsider their schedule. It was not surprising that the project was taking longer than anticipated. 
Not only are the complexities of the English language formidable, but it also never stops evolving. Murray and his dictionary colleagues had to keep track of new words and new meanings of existing words at the same time they were trying to examine the previous seventh century of the language's development. Now that is some crazy stuff. The next problem was, as soon as the original ten volumes of the Old English Dictionary were completed, Carnegie and Onion, the two editors still involved with the project, began updating it. In 1933, a single-volume supplement to the dictionary was published. Also at this time, the original dictionary was reprinted in 12 volumes, and the work was formally given its current title, the Oxford English Dictionary. In 1992, the dictionary again made history when a CD-ROM edition of the work was published. Suddenly, a massive, by then, 21-volume work that takes up four feet of shelf space and weighs 150 pounds is reduced to a slim, shiny disc that virtually takes up no space and weighs just a few ounces. I actually owned one of those, and I think I paid around $120 for it. How about that? So what is the current status of this amazing work? Today, once again, the Oxford English Dictionary is under alteration. Continuing the technological innovations, the dictionary is now available as an online publication designed to take full advantage of this powerful, an accessible medium. Where do you find this massive work? Head to www.oed.com. This truly is an amazing part of our history. Well, that's it for this edition of Our Amazing Stories. I hope you enjoyed it. If you have any ideas for stories for this segment or want to write one of your own, please let me know. I'd love to work with you on the project and want to hear any ideas that you might have. Just use the contact page on the main website and we'll get it done. Thank you for listening to Our Amazing Stories. We toast them crisp, we toast them light, you can tell by the taste, we toast them. They're a tasty treat, so good to eat, delicious and light from toast them. Toast them. And you know what? We like them. Well, that was episode number 530, and I want to thank Rodney Andrews for his story and David Sweeney Bear for reading our featured tale. Thank you, guys. If you want to follow the podcast or the blog, head to ronsamazingstories.com. There you will find any of the links I mentioned and how to contact us. Do you want to help the show? The best thing you can do is to tell your friends all about it, and please leave reviews or feedback wherever you listen. Clicking that follow or like button makes us grow. Thank you for listening, and I hope you come again to find out what are Ron's Amazing Stories. Ron's Amazing Stories.